Hello and uh, welcome to the Stroke Special Interest Group Student Corner uh, for the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy. Uh, my name is Arco Paul. Uh, I am a neurologic clinical specialist and a faculty at uh, Radford University Carilion, which is located in Virginia. Uh, I have with me um, Kristen Hammock here, who is a student of physical therapy at Wingate University in North Carolina. Um, Welcome, uh, Kristen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, like you said, my name is Kristen. I am a third year physical therapy student at Wingate University. Um, it's located just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I graduate in December, which is about a month from now. So can't That's wait. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for, for joining this uh, discussion. So we're going to, uh, we're here to talk about high intensity gait training. Uh, uh, and we're going to talk about a few practical uh, applications uh, for uh, the high intensity gait training clinical practice guideline that just recently came out. So let me share the screen at this moment. Uh, so this clinical practice guideline is actually known as a CPG to improve locomotor function following chronic stroke, incomplete spinal cord injury, and brain injury. And that's the actual name of this uh, clinical practice guideline. And it's freely available uh, to, uh, um, to readers uh, in this Academy's um, Journal of Neurologic Physical Therapy. Uh, so um, I wanted to just uh, provide you some of the key summary statements that I thought is most applicable uh, to your patient's case. Now, before we uh, look at your patient again, I want to quickly mention some of the limitations and caveats uh, when we um, apply this uh, practice guideline. Um, so, um, <clears throat> additionally, the Academy has provided uh, us with some uh, examples of strategies that we can use uh, when we are trying to implement uh, these recommendations in, in our clinic. And in order to be able to use it effectively, um, they have provided us this, uh, this chart uh, where we uh, basically look at um, some gross uh, gait subcomponents of our, um, uh, of our patient. Uh, and and uh, the way they have divided these um, uh, subcomponents are these four things here. So uh, the first one, if you look at the, the left column is uh, limb advancement, and then there is stance control, and then propulsion, and then finally balance or partial stability. But again, as you see, uh, at the very um, right column here, uh, the goal is to take the patient to that higher level of intensities in order to reap the benefits of, of gait training. All right, so the second case, um, it's a 57-year-old female who also had a stroke. Um, so she's a little bit younger than our last guy. Um, whereas the other guy was seven months post-stroke, she is only one month post-stroke. So she's more in that acute, subacute kind of phase. Um, we saw her in the inpatient rehab setting. Um, she also presented with some of that left-sided hemiparesis um, and left-sided impairments based on the stroke. Um, they definitely impacted her walking, which we'll see here in a minute when we play the video. Um, and like our other gentleman, her goal was to improve her walking abilities. Okay, um, so I know you did some assessments, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> move the slide now. So I think uh, you did some similar assessments on this patient too. Mm -hmm. So again, we did that 10 meter walk test to give us our gait speed. Um, her gait speed was a good bit slower than our last gentleman. Um, her self-selected speed and her fast speed were both the same. Um, so she wasn't really in able to increase her speed with cueing. Um, and they were both at a 0.24 meters per second, which puts her in the category of being a household ambulator. And again, being at an increased risk for falls just based on the speed that she walks at. Um, her six minute walk test was lower than our first gentleman's as well. Um, she was only able to go 78 meters in the six minutes, um, which is well below what's considered to be the norm. And that kind of indicates to us that she may have some poor endurance. 
Um, and that's something we'll need to take into consideration when we try to do our, our high intensity gait training. Um, her heart rate before and after, like the first gentleman, it did not increase very much. Um, hers was less than a 10 beat increase. But some of that could be because she was needing frequent rest breaks and she wasn't really able to ambulate at a high speed. Um, and then we also did the Berg balance scale on her as well, um, just because it's kind of uh, obvious by looking at her that she may have some balance impairments. So right. her score was a 33 out of 56, um, which again indicates that she is at an increased risk for falls and that balance may be something we want to address with her. Yes. So it looks like uh, this patient is a little different than the previous one. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you might have, you might want to focus on uh, some of the other subcomponents of uh, her function, gait function. So um, <clears throat> would you want to attempt um, um, a, a, an application of uh, the, the CPG on this patient? We know that she walks, we know that she walks slowly and that her gait speed is uh, less than ideal. Um, so propulsion would eventually be our goal, but I don't think that it's gonna be the first thing we need to address with her. Um, I think that she at first needs to work a little bit on her stance control and her balance and postural stability. Um, you can see that she's got a, a pretty heavy trunk lean, even where the video is stopped there. She's, she's leaning pretty heavily onto that loft strand crutch there. Um, so we can imagine, you know, if we take that away, she would probably not be able to maintain her balance um, and not be able to maintain stance without that external support. Um, so we need to take that into consideration for our starting point. Um, and then we also have her Heart rate range is there. Hers are going to be a little bit higher than the first gentleman's just because she is younger. Um, I did forget to mention this with the first gentleman, but if anybody out there is looking to calculate this, there's a very nifty calculator um, on the AMPT's website where you can plug in. Um, you plug in their Thanks. age, their resting heart rate, and whether they're on beta blockers or not. Um, I've used it in the past. It's very helpful. Great. Thanks um, for bringing that up. Pretty easy to find, too. Yeah. I I forgot to mention that I was going to, <laughs> um, but so with her, we're going to focus more on that stance control and balance and postural stability. Um, so we will probably need to provide some sort of body weight support, at least initially, just based on the fact that she seems to be losing her balance over towards one direction, especially if she doesn't have that crutch to kind of lean onto. Um, so I think with her, it would probably be best to start with body weight support over the treadmill. Um, and then we would start the treadmill kind of at whatever her fast speed is. So we know for her, her fast speed and her self-selected speed are not different. Um, so we would start at that speed and then we would try to increase the speed or increase the incline, something there to kind of ramp up the intensity. Um, and then obviously, as soon as she's able to kind of uh, excel or succeed with that kind of ambulation with the body weight support, we would try to reduce the amount of support we're giving her um, in order to, again, increase the intensity and keep it so that we're getting the effects of neuroplasticity there. Um, so for her, since we know her six minute walk test and her endurance is not extremely high, we may want to consider using kind of like a high intensity interval training mm -hmm. method for her. So we would set a Kind of like a definite period of time, we would say, okay, I want you to, to push for X amount of time and then we'll allow X amount of rest um, and do that repeatedly. That way we're still able to achieve that intensity, um, but at a level where she can maintain based on her endurance. Um, so I think that's kind of where we would start with her. Um, whereas the first gentleman was kind of in that third category where we could kind of challenge him. She may be more in that first category where we might need to provide some assistance um, at first and then hopefully be able to decrease it so that the harness is only for safety and then maybe progress from there. So that's how I would start with yeah, her. Absolutely, um, um, very well done. Uh, yeah, I can totally say, agree that this person um, needs to start uh, by improving stance control. And for that, we'll probably need um, some sort of unweighting in order to remain um, stable and so, probably are looking at uh, starting with some body weight support system on a, preferably on a treadmill. 
And then as you described, uh, try to reach the highest possible speeds uh, while still keeping the patient steady on the treadmill and then try to improve, increase the speeds uh, from there on uh, and, and look at uh, if the patient is still able to maintain um, stance control there. Uh, and in fact, I also forgot to mention something. Sometimes uh, as, you, as you were saying, it's difficult to increase uh, the heart rate and the intensity of gait training and that one of the reasons could be that uh, these patients are some sort of um, are on some sort of um, medications that uh, show a sort of a blunt response to any type of exercise, including gait type of exercise. Uh, so in that case, uh, instead of trying to use uh, the heart rate measure, we might have to use, uh, as you know, the rates of perceived ex exertion uh, in order to gauge uh, the level of intensity mm -hmm. there. So if you're using uh, uh, the rates of uh, perceived exertion scale, you're probably looking at um, having them perform gait at levels of three to seven on a, a scale of zero to 10. Or if you're using the Borg scale, mm -hmm. uh, the original Borg scale, uh, there you're looking at, um, your goal would be to try to engage them in gait training uh, with an intensity uh, or exertion intensity of 13 to 17. So that's, that's good. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, these lovely discussions. Uh, I hope uh, uh, other students uh, will find this, this discussion on high intensity gait training useful. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for talking to me. Mm -hmm.